fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred six point five FM Los Angeles. One hundred two point three FM Riverside. And one hundred five oh AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Joining me today is co-host Miss Jennifer Ann Gordon. How are you doing? I am fabulous, Alan. How are you today? I'm delicious as usual. Delicious. I wasn't expecting the delicious, but saucy, well, salty. <laughs> it's salty and it's salty and sweet because it's Thanksgiving in Canada. <laughs> the Canada Thanksgiving. Happy yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah, turkey gravy and uh, and uh, pumpkin pie. So sweet and salty. Well, while dinner's cooking, we're going to be talking to an author. He's got a new book out. The new book is called The Bell in the Fog. It's Evander Mills Book Two. So welcome to the show, Lev A. C. Rosen. Thank you. Hi, I'm so happy to be here, and happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, I'm working on it. <laughs> Jesus. So what is this? You've got this. This is the editor's pick, this new book that comes out October 10th. So when you get chosen an editor, editor's pick and you've got a new book coming out, do you feel even more pressure that it's going to do well? Uh, yes. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> Absolutely. It was terrifying. I mean, great honor, very exciting, but also what a thing to live up to. I'm very excited. It I don't know when this is going to air, but we're recording it the day before it comes out. So I am very much on pins and needles right now. Yeah, it sure changes the atmosphere uh, as to when you're writing it. Like, so when you're sitting down to do this book, that's not on your mind. You know what I'm saying? Like you're putting together the story and all that. At least I don't think so anyway. I mean, it's interesting. This is my first time doing like a sequel. And so certainly stuff from the first book was kind of on my mind, but it was mostly done by the time the first book came out. And uh, I just turned in the third one. So I haven't had a chance where like everything, the, the, the sort of compiling of all these things is uh, weighing me down. You know, the third one, I was very aware of what people said about the first one. So we'll see how, how much it all starts to uh, pile on as this goes along before I just fully lose my mind. <laughs> so, Lev, so you, when you were writing the very first book, you obviously didn't have a lot of expectations. Did you know going into book one that you wanted it to be a series? I did, yeah. That was always the goal. I wanted to uh, do a historical series, but I did. I wasn't sure that was going to happen, obviously, so I, I wrote it in such a way that it could go either way. And... Then uh, when I sold it, it was a two-book deal. So I knew right away going into sort of edits that there would be a sequel at the very least. Did you add anything in with like that second process of the edits to like like lead into the sequel or? I made the ending, it was always sort of ending where it was, but it uh, there's a more distinct setup for the sequel at the end of the first one now where it's like, not just, oh, yeah, you're going to have a life, but, like, here's the thing you're going to do now. Because uh, the first one almost works like a prologue in that uh, it's uh, before he sets up this detective agency that he now has established at the top of the second novel. I love it. So for our listeners who don't know the premise of these books, uh, can you, you know, give us your elevator pitch? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the real short... Your rambling elevator pitch. <laughs> it's funny, when I teach creative writing, one of the things I do in my novel class is I have everyone go around the room and describe their book in 25 words or less, and I count them out as they say the words. The real short one is historical mysteries in 1950 San Francisco, specifically the queer community. So the longer version of that is that we have a former cop uh, who at the top of the first book was 
caught in a raid on a gay bar and obviously fired in 1952 San Francisco. He's contemplating suicide when a woman comes up to him and asks him to solve the murder of her wife. And that takes him out of the city and he solves a mystery there. And by the end of it, he's really sort of gotten to a place where he can see a life for himself where he is out, essentially, you know, not super out because 1952, but where he's part of the queer community, which was thriving in uh, 1950s San Francisco. And so at the top of the second one, he's very aware of the fact that as a cop, he was he participated in the prosecution of that community. And so he's trying to make up for that both because he thinks he ought to and because he's not getting many clients as a gay detective over a gay club. <laughs> he knows that he has to make people trust him again, and he understands that he has to earn that. And so book two is sort of about him establishing that, but then all of a sudden someone from his past shows up with a um, blackmail case, and he has to deal with not just trying to establish himself um, in this queer community at all these gay bars, but figure out what drove him to join the cops in the first place. So this this character, this this detective you've got, Evander Mills. Andy. Yeah, he goes by Andy. Andy. So So who is he to you? What's your relationship with him? And I'd imagine... You start it with the character and and who he was first, and then put him in the setting. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of the setting, I grew up on the old Bogart and McCall movies. Like my parents raised me on those, and I love them. I love them all so much. So to me, noir and that sort of vintage period detective is a place I've always wanted to go. Um, but it was difficult to find a way in, and I wasn't sure that, you know, uh, writing queer mysteries was going to be accepted by publishing in general, or if it was just going to be this very niche thing. I was looking for a way in and trying to figure out what that was going to be. And it all happened with the first one one day while I was watching an Agatha Christie adaptation, I think the uh, Ordeal by Innocence one. I was watching that and I thought, this is so fun, but how much fun would it be if they were all gay? And so that concept was what triggered the first one. But I also knew I wanted to do the noir thing more than the Christie thing. And so the first one sort of blends those. But in the second one, we really get into that noir feeling. And I got to sort of flesh out what I wanted to do with this noir detective. And, you know, I knew in the first book, Andy had to start sort of destroyed. And he was someone who lived a life that wasn't really a life. He lived these two separate lives. One where he was a good cop and, like, genuinely was trying to help people. And one where at night he would go to these gay bars and find someone to hook up with and uh, not pursue a relationship. And neither of these lives were a whole life, but he was really good at keeping secrets. And because of that, he was really good at spotting other people keeping secrets. And that was sort of his arrogance on some level and also, you know, his, his detective superpower. That idea that uh, uh, idea is what brought me to create Andy's arc in the first book where he goes from just shattered and depressed and suicidal to someone who can maybe see a life for themselves as a queer person trying to solve crime in 1952 which he never thought was possible and in the second book we get to see him trying to really establish that and it's someone who sees secrets and knows secrets and, like, understands this world of keeping secrets that you had to do when you were queer in the 50s, but also really wants to sort of help people, not just in keeping those secrets, but in making sure that they can live as good lives as they deserve, the whole queer community. And in that, almost, and I don't think he's quite there yet, he almost sees and wants for himself to live this best possible life. But I have seen him described as a sad boy online, and I can't disagree with that. I mean, I'm a sucker for a good sad boy, so <laughs> yeah, love it. Um, so, Lev, I started reading A Bell in the Fog, and 
I knew it was the second book in a series, so then I stopped reading it, and I bought um, The Lavender House on audio, and I started listening to that, <laughs> and your narrator is so, so good, yeah. um, so I was I was wondering and hoping it's going to be the same narrator for the second book. It is, because Adam, um, he is amazing, I've met him in person, uh, we, he's, he's out in LA and I had an LA event and we like chatted and we chatted beforehand too. So I like, I, 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 I gave him a little direction here and there. I said, you know, I, the comparisons I give him for the characters are always, uh, actors from the forties and fifties. Perfect. So <laughs> I would be like this vibe here, this vibe here. And he's just so good. And he also actually does some of the audio, the Raymond Chandler, Chandler audio books. So he's like perfect, and he's queer. So it's all so it's all good. Yeah. So when you when you were writing Andy, and you, you, okay, so you said like your inspiration was obviously like Humphrey Bogart and these classic noir detective movies. If they were filming this now, do you have an actor that would be like your dream actor in this? Film? Oh, see, that's a question I have been forbidden to answer. <laughs> The issue is, and this is like such a terrible sort of show busy thing, if I were to answer that and then if it were potentially to be made into a show or movie, then they would, you know, and the actor they approach isn't the one I name, then that, that, then that is discouraging. Oh, so can you, can you tell us your second choice? <laughs> <laughs> Or who you would like to see in the role the least? <laughs> um, I can tell you how I would cast it in the 40s. So uh, in the second book, there are some great characters. You know, Andy, Andy's so difficult in the 40s. You know, Bogart didn't have that sort of, he had a weariness, but his, his weariness tended to uh, be more aggressive, a little angrier. Um, uh, so he doesn't have that sadness that I would really want. But, you know, the side characters are a lot easier to cast. So Helen, who is a figure from his past, who is a drag king, um, that thought they, they would have used the term male impersonator, but uh, she is duplicitous and, like, difficult to read and uh, is... I, I loved writing Helen, and she would be Veronica Lake in a heartbeat. I even say, you know, even though she's got her hair up all the time because she's in drag, I even have one moment where she takes it down and it covers half her face. And at one point she like has to sort of walk around, you know, a, 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 as a, a good sort of heteronormative woman. And she has the long blonde hair covering one side of her face again. So Veronica like in a heartbeat and the, the love interest from the past, James, he is a little more complicated. I want him to be sexy, obviously, but also a little, Feet, if that's a word. There's something a little pompous about James. And so the person I tend to go to is more, is sort of an Errol Flynn figure for James. But Andy, you know, I have heard a lot of people tell me who they would cast from the 40s even. And no one sits quite right. And I think that, that might be because, you know, after a while, someone becomes so real in your head, they can't become another actor. Alan Ladd. Yeah, Alan Ladd is good. Alan Ladd did, uh, did Bogart, right? Opposite Veronica Lake, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he was good. Yeah, and he's good because he's also got a, a, a subtle sexiness, and at the same time, his eyes are very um, intimate. He looks at a lot of people, and he can be quiet, yet still, he was good at that kind of dark role. Yeah, he's a really good choice. He's a very good choice. <laughs> of course, there's me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> no, I'm the one you least want. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying, Ellen, you're not giving off a sad boy vibes enough for this no, role? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just a nasty old bitch, as they call it now. <laughs> I love that there is a drag king in this because, fun fact, I used to choreograph for a drag king troupe. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> There's not just drag kings, there's drag queens. Yeah. There, uh, yeah, no, I, I was really excited that I got to bring in a character in the sequel who essentially I gave, I gave Andy a girl Friday, and they even call them that, uh, who is a, a, a female impersonator and who switches pronouns depending on if they're in drag or not. And so I think, like, by today, 
uh, language would probably go by gender fluid or non-binary or something like that. That was really fun to do. Like, cause he, he has this, dra- he has this detective office right next to the dressing room for all these fe- male and female impersonators. I love it so much. <laughs> I want to work there. <laughs> yeah, me, I, I already, th- I'm there. Listen, you say that, uh, the characters become so real in your head and I'm sure Andy has. So in that case, you're going through the, you've done two books and you go through the whole life that you've written for this character. And, uh, you know, in essence, you've really lived that life mm-hmm. for the, the whole time that you, you write a book and you're being part of the character. So at the end of it, it's all in and ready to come out. I'd imagine that that process in itself has changed you somewhat. <laughs> what an interesting question. Um, does it change you to write a character for that long? Or is that character something that's already sort of inside you and it's really more the act? Well, you know, because you've got to feel it. In a sense, if the character becomes a real person, you guys are working together for, let's say, a year or whatever the time is to get the book done. And all the things that your character and you put them through, you know, the the good, the bad, the sad, the happy, the the crimes, the, the you know, all of these feelings, in order to be real, a lot of times... It's real to you. So you're feeling these things. You're going through the same emotions. And it's almost like living that life for a year mm-hmm. or, or whatever time it is. I'd imagine that's going to change you somewhat. Uh, and so the next book that you tackle, you're now slightly different than you were before you did this. I think that's true. I think that's such an interesting point. And I think that, you know, the stuff that Andy goes through, obviously part of it and part of the emotion you draw from personal experience, certainly. And that weaves into this imaginated experience, imaginated, oh boy, this imagined, <laughs> this imagined experience. And that becomes something unique. And certainly, you know, the stuff Andy has to do in the second book, and I don't want to get into spoiler ter- territory, but, you know, there's some bad things that happen in this noir. <laughs> um, and, the way he deals with them and the things he uncovers, I think, make him a little sadder even, uh, you know. But I, I, I think the, re- the way that I get around that, and even Andy gets around it, is I try to always, you know, the I'm going to digress for a moment here. The, the big difference between the movies, the old Bogart and McCall movies, and, and the books that they're based on is the Hayes Code. And Hayes Code was terrible in many, 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 many ways. <laughs> but the one thing it did do is it tended to mean that endings were happier. Even in this noir, you know, that my favorite Bogart and McCall is The Big Sleep. And the thing I always think about is the very end of that, where they essentially decided to cover up a murder and lie to the police and send her sister away to uh, an asylum. There's this moment where they're standing alone in the darkness and and, uh, you can hear the sirens wail as the cops approach them and people are dead. You know, they've killed people. You know, they have it all figured out. And and he says as much and she goes, there's one thing you forgot. And he goes, what's that? And she goes, what about me? And he goes, what's wrong with you? And she says, nothing you can't fix. And they cling to each other as the sirens sort of blare and the fades to darkness. And there's this idea in that, that, yes, the world is closing in around you. Yes, the world is dark and scary and paranoid. And that is definitely what it was like being gay in the 50s. But you find these moments of lightness and hope in community, in coming together, in love, in the Bogart and Bacall sense. But in the books, it's more about coming together. And so I always try to put that in my books. And so while I go through all this with Andy, all this darkness, there is always also the sense of hope that stems from community. And honestly, I think that's the thing that's changed me more than the darkness. It has made me so much more aware of the queer community and the the solace it provides when the world is closing in around you and like what perfect timing for that. (laughs) Yeah. um, That was really beautiful, Lev. Um, (laughs) Thank you. I was like, 
just so like transfixed. Um, but I was wondering, because you don't only write mystery and noir, you also write rom-coms mm-hmm. and YA. That's the other bomb. <laughs> yeah. It's like, so what, <laughs> how do you switch universes in your head? Are you working on just one project at a time? Do you use the lighter work as like a palette cleanser? What is that like to work? I try to go back and forth. Like, so due to like wacky shenanigans in publishing, um, I, the Bell in the Fog is out October 10th, uh, tomorrow for me. And then November 7th, my next uh, YA rom-com is out. So there's less than a month between them. I, know, I saw that on your website, and I was just like, oh, publishing. <laughs> I mean, it, it was because things got sort of backed up during COVID, and, like, you know, people were, were getting back late. And also because uh, the different publishers have different lead times. So uh, my adult publisher, they only need stuff sort of a year out. My YA publisher needs stuff 18 months out. Yeah, I try to go back and forth because the YA and the romance especially is sort of this palate cleanser in many ways. Um, uh, but also, I they both can occupy my brain in different ways because, you know, we're all complicated. We all contain multitudes. I love a good rom-com, and I love also writing them for teenagers, um, especially queer teenagers, uh, who maybe haven't seen that or don't see it the way that I would want to show them. You know, my YA stuff, I try to unpack the gay stereotypes that were always sort of thrown at me growing up and make and humanize those people, those stereotypes and make them like fun and wonderful and give them happiness. And I think that that hopefully inspires queer teenagers to sort of be like, you know what, even if someone is throwing this stereotype at me, is sort of monitoring the type of queer that I'm supposed to be or not supposed to be, which I think a lot of straight people do, especially adults to teenagers, I get to be whatever I want to be. And so... And I feel like adults do it to other adults. Oh, yeah, adults definitely As a bisexual woman, I've heard many times that like, oh, well, you don't seem queer or you're not queer Mm -hmm. enough. And I'm like, um... Yeah, no, that... That's weird. (laughs) It's constant that people are always sort of telling you the right way to be gay. And, uh, you know, the being able to it, it blow that up in uh, YA is such a freedom. And it's such a different thing because it's, you know, watching the ways, you know, in my last YA rom-com camp, I mention this bit of queer history that will also come into the Andy Mills uh, mysteries uh, at some point which is the Mattachine Society, which is a pre-Stonewall gay rights organization. What They had this very different mentality than, uh, you know, the post-Stonewall gay rights activism that we, we think of, in that they believed that it was their responsibility to essentially assimilate as much as possible, that the only thing that made them different was their attraction to the same sex. And in every other regard... They were just, you know, air quotes, normal people. There was even this big falling out about it, and they ousted their founders based on the word, the idea of, like, if queer people had their own culture or not. And, like, you know, the Mattachine Society ousted their founders because they felt that they did not. There was no such thing as queer culture because queer people were just like everybody else. And they, their activism in many ways was about being as heteronormative as possible to the point where their meetings, there's a story, uh, and this is the one I tell in camp too, of how a uh, there was a butched woman who joined the Magic Society and uh, the first time she walks across the room and heals, everyone applauds uh, because she's finally become the, what they, they believe is the correct way to be a lesbian. And so watching these arguments and writing them, you know, decades apart (laughs) and researching the history and seeing the things that we are still dealing with today is so interesting and it's disheartening in some ways, but it's also actually really inspiring because we also see the way, you know, I also see the way these things were overcome and dealt with. And yes, we're always going back to the same issues over and over again, but like, Today, you look at something like book banning 
And, you know, I, I, one of my YAs is very, very, very banned, like the 23rd most banned in the country, I think, was what the list said. And um, Which one is that? Is that Jack of Hearts? Another it place? is. <laughs> my sex ed thriller. <laughs> um, and so I look at the book banning and I look at the way that, you know, they crack down on things in the past. And so little spoiler alert here. The third Andy Mills book, which I turned in, is going to deal with gay uh, book services, which were, and it was a big thing. There were a lot of gay books in the 50s. You would sign up, and uh, these publishers would send you essentially a gay book a month, except sending gay stuff through the mail. The post office ended up cracking down on some of them for essentially sending indecent materials. And so you look at that, and you look at the way it was overcome. And, like, there were lawsuits, and people fought back. And then you get through it. And yes, we repeat these things in different ways, The you know, but we get through it. And so being able to study that and write about getting through it in the past helps me write about getting through it in the present as well. Just like writing about it through the present makes me rethink the way that people got through it in the past, if that makes sense. And so there is this sort of tangled joy to both of them and i do think they speak to each other in a way i think that that softness of noir that i talk about in those movies and the Hayes code i think that i get that from writing my rom-coms and my rom-coms are often described as spiky <laughs> uh and like deal with social critique and like stuff like that and i think that comes from my old noir and that helps me sort of they're they're sides of the same coin, I think is what I'm saying. Right, right. Are you are you conscious of the violence and the sex that you write in your books? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The first book, one thing I saw was a lot of people putting up content warnings. And I have no problem with content warnings. I think that's appropriate. You know, I don't put them at the start of my book because uh, my publisher generally feels that the, you know, if you're reading a historical noir, you know, it, 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 people should expect darkness and we don't need to spoil it for them. And I think that's that's a perfectly healthy mentality, too. You know, I didn't realize how much people would be affected by that violence, I guess, because writing it, it felt obviously awful, but inevitable to me. You know, yes, it's the 1950s. He's been outed on the police force. Someone is going to beat him up, and someone's going to call him a bad name. And that, to me, felt inevitable. Um, so I was a little surprised to see people surprised by it, if that makes sense. And I do wonder if that's because they associated me more with my YA work, where I, I don't think I shy away from it, quite the same way like but uh certainly i try to uh you know my way they're rom-coms there's no violence <laughs> yeah, change that <laughs> <laughs> yeah real dark rom-coms are you are you are you thinking like when you when you're putting together the story what you're going to put your character through are you also thinking about your reader is there like a a subtext or a meaning behind what what the book is about or are you writing purely entertainment i think with these books with the evander mills mystery um i think that the thing i always that i want to do with them is explore queer history and make it fun so being able to explore that queer history i think is inevitably sort of important and uh it it gives us a it changes a reader who didn't know that that history existed which is most of us um, you know, as a as a gay person, you know, one of the things I always say is we're not raised by queer people, most of us. Most of us are not raised by queer people. You know, we don't have someone teaching us our history, which is already so erased. Um, you know, as a Jewish person, certainly I was raised by my Jewish parents. They taught me all about Judaism. Um, as a queer person, I had to find that stuff out myself, and it is hidden. So being able to access that and make it something that is fun and entertaining, I hope will educate people and also tell queer people, like, you know, we've been here forever. We've gone through these things before, like I said, uh, and we've gotten through it. That, to me, is an exciting thing to sort of put in 
along with the entertainment. So I'm hoping to do both, but like in the end, I really hope, you know, people just read them for a good mystery. The, the queer history is like really fun and exciting and, and good to learn. The mystery is the part that's over that. The queer history is almost like a bonus. Yeah, I feel like the mystery is like the drug that gets you, like, gets you hooked on it. And you're like, oh. <laughs> um, what was your research pr- process like? Because you just mentioned the fact that most queer history is really hidden mm-hmm. in a way. So, like, how did you, you know, get in there? Like, where was your starting point? Like, uh, So I am very lucky in that there is a book called Wide Open Town, and it is about pre-Stonewall, queer San Francisco. It's by Nan Alamilla Boyd, and it has been my, like, Bible for this series. It has so much information in it. And, you know, they, they there are books like that for other major metropolitan cities, I think, but, like, just a few and it's wild. And, um, you know, it's an academic book. It's an academic history book. It's not something that someone would uh, necessarily pick up for pleasure, usually. Yeah, you're like not going to find it in Barnes & Noble on the end cap. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not even like a historical biography like my dad would read. Uh, it's something that I read in my queer history class in college. You know, that that book has been just perfect to me and it's provided me with so much but there are other books and uh we're also in this sort of renaissance like all of a sudden there's so much more queer history coming out and it's very exciting you know the there's the third book i just used a lot was called it's called buying gay and it's sort of the history of how things were sold to queer people and how queerness was part of that selling even back in the 50s where they were trying to hide it so that's and that you know that had a lot of information on these book services, for example, the Bell in the Fog, because there's so much of Andy's past in the Navy. One of the books I used is, and it's an older one called Out of the Past by Alan Barube. Barube, I, I think it's Frencher than I think it is. I think it's Barube. Barube, that sounds possible. Yes. Uh, I only say that because I went to, like, a Frenchy school, so. <laughs> uh, the accent mark is just very confusing to me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that is a queer history of World War II, essentially, um, and the armed services in World War II. And uh, that one came out in the 90s, actually, because this historian found all these letters from gay servicemen, sort of, like, in a like someone was redoing their house and they found this like cache of all these old letters and he, he read them all and that was like his primary sort. Anyway, so that one was really important for the, this book. And it's interesting because that book is older. They're both a little older. I think they're both from the nineties. They were, you know, rare, special things at the time. And now we're seeing so much more that's adding to that. So I have these as my sort of, my post, my TED posts, and then I get to read stuff like Buying Gay, um, stuff by Hugh Ryan. There are all these, uh, you know, queer historians now that are doing great work, and they're filling in a lot of things that these books, like, talked about, but they were smaller details. So, you know, they then they had a book to write, so they focused on the book. But now here comes along Hugh Ryan, Eric Servini, and they're going to give me weird details. Uh, here's like a, a, sp- a specific thing, you know, Hugh Ryan's last book is specifically about a women's prison in the village and how oh, that like was this big queer activism hub. It's wild watching history get filled in right now while also, of course, watching people try to prevent it from being taught in schools. Are are you a big guy in social media? Where do people find you? Yeah, uh, you can find me uh, on you know Instagram, Blue Sky, etc. Lev AC Rosa, no periods, no spaces, just L E V A C R O S E N. On Facebook, it's just Lev Rosen. I am most active on Instagram. Uh, that is where you will find pictures of my cat. That was going to be my next <laughs> question. My most important question. Uh, you can always find me also at levacrosen.com. Um, uh, but I'm not, I, I, I should be better on social media, but honestly, like, I find it, especially now, there's like 20 of them. 
It's very, it's, it's intimidating and exhausting, and I just want to sit and write in my room. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. no. Yeah, it's easy to get caught and stuff like that, you know, get caught up. And Well, listen, this has been really, really fascinating conversation. We enjoyed having you here. And, of course, the newest book is called The Bell in the Fog. And our guest is the author of that, Lev A.C. Rosen. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Lev. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.